Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. Namaste, participating in the Design Team. Amen. Uh, the commemoration of St. Eusebius of Vercelli. Um, it just says, I think, St. Eusebius in the Missal, and you might be confused if you've studied any, any kind of history. There is um, Eusebius the historian. Uh, he was also a bishop, uh, but um, not a saint. So this is St. Eusebius of Vercelli, bishop of a city in northern Italy. And um, uh, I would say... I, I, a saint for modern times, I would say, as you will see. Very interesting. I think I, I, I gave this sermon last year, um, but I figure if I find my own sermons interesting a year later, you probably will as well. So, um, quite, quite, I don't know, quite a story. So, he was born in the year 283 on the island of Sardinia, and his father was martyred when he was only a young boy. So, he had a very early, um, I would, you would say, um, uh, was, was impressed at a young age of the firmness of the faith. I mean, imagine if your own father had been a martyr giving his life for the faith. That, that would leave a lifelong impression, and it certainly did on young uh, Eusebius. Uh, he went to Rome and became a cleric and then a priest. And interestingly, <clears throat> I couldn't find the connection. Um, somehow the people of Vercelli in northern Italy, uh, when their bishop died, they, they didn't want any of the candidates proposed to them. They demanded Eusebius by name, uh, uh, still, still in Rome. So he, he left Rome and then went and became uh, the bishop there of Vercelli. And um, he lived there a very holy life until he was 70 years old. You would think his life is over with. That's done. I mean, how many saints have died at, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or whatever? So here he is, 70 years old, and then that's when the action begins in his life. Not something a 70-year-old wants to hear. I can tell you that, right? They're like, I'm done. I'm retired. Um, and before that even, though, um, he lived for that 70 years. He introduced a way of living that was a little bit unusual. It was kind of a combination of the priesthood and the... Um, uh, the the um, eremitical life. You would have these hermits that went out into the wilderness and lived alone in asceticism and prayer and, and so on. But then you had priests who went out and ministered to the people. And uh, uh, so, um, you know, and the, and the hermits would eventually gather into communities and, and would live together. So he combined the both of them, is, is he combined the, uh, a community of priests, and they were very ascetic, they, they spent their time in prayer, but they also went out and ministered to the people. So that, was, that really hadn't been done before, and he himself as bishop lived there with these priests um, in community. And eventually, uh, St. Augustine would take that and found an order called the Augustinians, uh, and it is a way of, 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 and they're called canons, right? So um, uh, the founders of the Augustinians, or the, the Augustinians rather, hold as their founder St. Augustine and St. Eusebius of Vercelli for their, their way of life. So that, that's what he did for 70 years, was, was living with these priests. Then, uh, in 354, um, Pope Liberius asked him to go on an important mission to the emperor, Constantius II. So this is 354. Uh, Nicaea had happened, you know, some 25 years previous. Uh, Constantine had finally made Christianity uh, legal in the empire and so on. And, and by this time, 354, um, the church had been uh, gaining... Um, uh, recognition, ascendancy, it was in fact even becoming popular. And the trouble is when you have an institution that is persecuted, um, I mean it's very difficult, but when you have an institution that is popular, uh, the persecution starts from within. It begins to get rotten. People join it not because of, of faith or sincerity, but because of popularity or advantage. And that was starting to happen in the church. And so what you had was Arianism. Arianism was growing, which was a heresy claiming that Christ our Lord was not um, equal to the Father, uh, that, that he was somehow a, crea a creature, a creation, a creation. This had been condemned at Nicaea in 325. It was still a problem. In 354, Arianism was still a problem. And so it was, it was causing such trouble 
uh, that uh, Liberius asked uh, Eusebius, you need to go to the emperor and request a council be called in Milan uh, to, to, to deal with this problem of Arianism. And um, in fact, due to this heresy, several bishops had already been deposed and sent into exile by Arian bishops. Most notably was St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria. And so Eusebius went to the emperor and asked him, you, you need to convene this council. There's this Arianism, it's, it's a problem. And so Constantius II does call the council. He holds it in Milan, Italy. And the, the goal of the Pope is to get uh, the exiled bishops restored, among them St. Athanasius, and to have the orthodoxy, which had been outlined at um, Nicaea, to be proclaimed. This is the orthodox faith, Arianism is condemned, exiled bishops are deposed, especially Athena uh, exiled bishops are restored, especially Athanasius. So this is the goal of the, this council that they're calling. Emperor Constantius II calls the council, uh, and um, uh, uh, um, Eusebius of Vercelli attends. There's one other cleric with him, and then there's also the Bishop of Milan is in communication with the Pope. So they arrive, and Constantius uh, permits a council to be called. Over a hundred bishops attend, and it convenes. He has them in, in a great hall. Once the council convenes, the emperor locks all the doors in the hall and presents an article which condemns Athanasius and promotes Arianism. It was a trap, like he didn't know that Constantius already was an Arian himself. And so it had the exact opposite. And, and Constantius presented to all the bishops present, you have two choices, either sign these documents promoting Arianism, condemning Athanasius, or die. Like those are your options. So which one are you gonna pick? Uh, out of the hundred bishops who were there, it was Eusebius of Vercelli, the cleric was with him, and the bishop of Milan, they refused. They would not sign it. Everybody else signed this heretical document, every other bishop. Uh, so it, it turns out that, that, that um, they were not uh, executed, those three, but they were sent into exile. And so Eusebius is, you know, 70, maybe 71 years old. He spends the next seven years in exile. Um, he was sent to Syria and then sent to Turkey and finally to Egypt. And I mean, he's, you know, 80 years old almost, you know, in his mid 70s, uh, an aged and venerable old man. And yet he was treated very roughly. He was ridiculed. He was beaten in different places. And one, one city even dragged him through the streets. Uh, but he remained constant in his faith. Uh, and in the, in, in the spite of complete failure. The, the, this council was called by the Pope and that, that we need to do something. This is a terrible crisis. We're going to call this council. This is going to fix everything. It made everything worse. What were they going to do? How was the church going to recover? The, the Arianism, St. Jerome said, the world groaned and found itself Arian. Uh, Athanasius was exiled. He was one of the only bishops who was vocally effective in fighting Arianism, and he was exiled. The Pope, it seemed, was helpless. Um, everything was stacked against it. The church was infected, uh, bishops were heretical everywhere, and the government was against the church as well. Does that sound familiar? Right? Any, any, anything like we're experiencing today? <clears throat> and now, what was the solution? So Constantius II eventually dies, as all emperors do, no matter how powerful you are, you will die. And there, I mean, you can imagine the prayers, uh, begging God, we need a good emperor to be uh, appointed next. We need somebody who's good and strong and, and sympathetic to the faith, somebody who's not a heretic. This is what the church needs. You know, spare, O oh Lord, spare your people. You can imagine the prayers. So what do you think they got after Constantius II, who was an Arian? Julian the Apostate, who not only was not an Arian, he hated Christ, he hated the church, and he made it his mission to destroy it. And in fact, you had several martyrs under Julian the Apostate, um, uh, who, 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 was, who was martyring people in his own. We're, so we're going back 100 years. Like, not only did we not get something bad, we got something worse. Now, well, do you think this was part of God's plan? Well, it's part of God's permissive plan because um, one of the ways that God achieves his goals is by letting evil get what it wants. And now, what did Julian the Apostate do when he came into power? 
He hated the church and he wanted to weaken it. And he noticed that there were all these exiled bishops who had been driven out by Arians. And he thought, you know, so he looks at the church and says, okay, so the church, I mean, I don't care doctrine, dogma, I don't care one bit. What I do see is if I bring back all of these exiled bishops, that's going to weaken the church because there's going to be more like uh, I'm fighting and intrigue and so on. So it is Julian the apostate who recalls Athanasius and recalls all of the Orthodox Catholic bishops and Julian the apostate deposes the heretical bishops. You would never have seen that coming. Who, who, could have, who could have thought that? And so Eusebius of Vercelli gets recalled. He is, is reinstated in his see uh, there in northern Italy. And the church, and, and Julian the Apostate dies after, it was a catastrophic reign of like only a few years. He dies very shortly. And in fact, uh, his dying words of Julian the Apostate uh, was, Galilean, you win. So he recognized you, you cannot fight God and win. So um, that is hope unlooked for. Um, Eusebius was returned, Athanasius was returned. Uh, God can bring good out of evil. Um, Pope Damasus succeeded Pope Liberius, and after just a few more years, it was uh, required that no one was able to be ordained a bishop without first making a profession of faith according to the Nicene Creed, condemning Arianism. And so that, that, that was the, that was the uh, end of uh, St. Eusebius's adventures. He did make it back to his um, uh, uh, see in, in Vercelli, uh, the, to the, much to the joy of the people, and he lived out the rest of his days in peace. He actually died uh, peacefully there in his city. And he's an example of a white martyr. In fact, I mean, he's styled, if you celebrated the feast of St. Eusebius of Vercelli, the, the color would be red. He is called a martyr in the um, um, breviary. Uh, but that is, that, that is where the church gets the idea of a white martyrdom. He didn't know for seven years in exile, how could he have known he would be recalled? He's like, he, for all he knew, he was gonna die in exile. Uh, you know, ridiculed and so on, the church was failing. How did he know that that wasn't gonna happen? Uh, and so that's the case with the martyrs. The martyrs, what really, what really um, um, makes the difference for the martyr is on the inside. The fact whether they're killed or not is not really up to them. How many people were you know, thrown to the lions or, or tried to boil them in oil or something or condemned to death and it just never happened, but they were constant and firm in the faith. So, so um, that is where we get the idea that you give your life for Christ, not right now, but over the course of 70 years, every single day, every single moment, you're giving your life for Christ. That is a white martyrdom, accepting anything, any misfortune that happens to you. Uh, furthermore, um, you know, let us not despair that we see evil triumphing on all sides. It doesn't matter. Um, in fact, I would say that's probably how God is going to work his um, miracle turnaround, is, is gonna be by um, a, a source that we would not expect. And that makes sense to me. If, if there was somebody who came in and thought, I'm gonna save the church or I'm gonna save America, and they actually did it, imagine the pride, the, acts, the overweening pride of that person. Now you have somebody coming in saying, I'm gonna destroy the church, I'm gonna destroy America, and they do the opposite, well then you know that was God's will entirely. So I, I am convinced, and I've been for a while, that's what's gonna happen, that's what we're gonna see, is evil is going to fall on its own sword. They're gonna dig a pit and fall into it themselves. Um, it is God who's gonna bring the victory, uh, but he's gonna do it through the small and the weak, right? Those people you would never expect. So, um, that's why it's so important to pay attention to the little things, that the white martyrdom of, of St. Eusebius, being willing to give your life for Christ however and whenever he asks, in a big way or in a little way. You know, when, when your life is taken from you by an angry mob, or when your life is taken from you bit by bit by a mob of kids who want you another sandwich, you know, change my diaper, this, that, whatever it is. You, you, that, that, that's sanctity. It doesn't matter, big or little, sanctity is, is the generosity you give to God, and, and that is what God uses to change the world and affect big changes. So um, let us take that to heart, ask for the intercession of St. Eusebius and all saints and all bishops who have lived through difficult times in the church. This is no different than before. God will see us through. We have to be willing to suffer however he sees fit, and we will, we will be um, imitating Christ in so doing. Uh, so God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.